Welcome back to another session of Better Podcasting Chats with me, I'm SP. This is a streamed and recorded casual conversation with other hobby and passion podcasters to share their experience, knowledge, joy, and enthusiasm of podcasting. Better Podcasting is a project by Stephen John Drew and myself to help hobby and passion podcasters start their podcasts and make their existing projects better. That's why we came up with the name Better Podcasting. It is our hope that bringing on new voices from hobby and passion podcasting spaces with different viewpoints will help others just as much as listening to Stephen and myself. I want to say thank you to Jeff Aiken from the Babylon 5 for the First Time podcast for joining me in the previous chat. You can check out Jeff at www.babylon, the number five, the word first.com. Now, for the next few moments, I'm going to talk about my passion because we're all hobby and passion podcasters, and this is my passion. It's space. In Boca Chica, Texas, preparations remain underway for Starship's orbital flight test, which could come as early as Friday, March 10th, 2023. I doubt it, but it could. There has been a Marine Safety Information Bulletin issued for March 10th, but there are no overpressure notices or road closures issued at this time. Regardless, it's an exciting time with Starship's first launch coming soon, and it will probably happen in March 2023. Now, on the NASA side of the house, Crew-6 launched the International Space Station in the early morning hours on Thursday, March 2nd, 2023, on board a SpaceX Dragon, which was the capsule Endeavor and a Falcon 9 rocket. Crew 6 docked with the International Space Station about a day later on Friday, March 3rd, 2023. There are currently 11 persons on board the ISS until Crew 5 is due to return tomorrow as we record this, along with the upcoming return of the Soyuz MS-22 crew on board the MS-23 Soyuz, which is now docked to the space station. Perhaps in the future, I might go in more depth on the Soyuz MS-22 and the Progress MS-21 issues, but we'll leave that story for another day for now. In my podcasting on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., the agents and I are waiting one more week to review Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, as one of our team could not go to the theater. So we did an all-news podcast and said, and that's on the feed over at LegendsofShield.com. The Better Podcasting live chat took a week off due to some home improvement projects at the John Drew household. Everything's fine. He just had some things he had to do, so we begged off for a week. And my side gig, or moonlighting, or whatever you want to call it, on Strange New Worlds Fancast continues as Shannon, Jake, and I cover the Picard final season three episodes. I got to tell you, as being a lifelong Trek fan, that has been excruciating fun for me. In the meantime, for the next hour, I'm chatting with a person with a passion for writing and podcasting about science fiction. Daniel Smith is the host of Coffee in Space. It's a show that discusses the science fiction and fantasy characters we love and the journeys they take. Daniel interviews authors like Andy Weir, David Brin, C. Robert Cargill, and others about their books, world building, and major themes. Welcome to the conversation, Daniel. Hey, thanks for having me, SP. Uh, I really look forward to learning from this. I've been learning from you for a, f- a few weeks now, and, and I'm, I'm excited to have this chat, man. I'm excited to have this chat with you, too, because I listened to some of your podcasts in preparation for this. And I'm like, yeah, that's actually something. I wish I would have known about it earlier. I would have same subscribed or followed Likewise. and would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question for you. I was thinking about this as I was listening to your latest couple of episodes. Now, if you, in fact, find yourself in line, let's just pretend, right? Whether you do or you don't. If you find yourself in line at Barnes and Nobles Mm -hmm. and a fellow patron mentions to you that they wish they'd have a new podcast to listen to, how would you describe your show to them? Well, you actually already did. I would just say that you should listen to Coffee in Space, where the host has conversations about science fiction characters that we love and the journeys they take, and he has the authors on to talk about it. And so, uh, so that's really it. And then I'd be bashful and I'd uh, blush really bad because I can't, I have no poker face. (laughs) And then I'd admit that it was my show. So that's what I would do. I see. And since you were in line for coffee, would you describe what coffee you take? And would you ask them about their coffee as well? 
Well, I'd have to because I pretty much ask every author that comes on uh, how they take their caffeine or their coffee in, in particular. Some of them drink tea, a lot of authors drink tea, so that's something that comes up. But, you know, I'm a cream and sugar guy. If I can get a little French vanilla in there, I will, depending on which place I'm at. If I'm at Starbucks, actually, uh, I do a cappuccino there. So it would just depend on where I'm at. But if it's Barnes & Noble, I think they're pretty much all cappuccinos from Starbucks. Yeah. I do everything from loose leaf tea all the way up to the, the hard stuff, the espressos, the mm. cappuccinos, that sort of stuff. So I don't have a preference. There's just a wide range of stuff. And it just depends on what I'm in the mood for. So yep. I don't have one particular thing. Although right now I'm taking coffee black right now. So I'm impressed with the time of day that you're drinking coffee. I confess I am drinking water just to keep my throat wet, but I'm not trying coffee right now. Normally I do that. But, you know, after this gets done, I start processing the files to get them out. So I need to stay yeah. awake for a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, then I have to get up really early the next morning and go to work. So mm. that's the drag. The old day job. Yep, not my full-time job. Yep. So where does the name Coffee in Space come from? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Way to start it off. So Coffee in Space comes from, I mean, as authors, especially in an interview situation, we like to have a seat around a table with a cup of coffee and we like to just chat about writing in general or our books in particular, characters, issues that we've got with the plots, holes we can't fill, things like that. And it's, it's just best done around a cup of coffee. Several authors I know, myself included from time to time, go to coffee shops to do their writing. And so coffee just, coffee had to be a part of it. And I wanted it to be a part of the conversation piece. And then, of course, everything's better in space. So that's really where it came from. Since we're just open kimono here about being a better podcaster. That was the title I came up with in March of 2020. I don't know that I follow the rules the way I'm supposed to. Like, I don't know if I would just say to the guy or gal in line at Barnes and Noble, hey, you should listen to Coffee in Space. I don't know that that would automatically tell them that this is a podcast about science fiction stories from the perspective of the author of the book. I think I probably should have workshopped that a little bit in hindsight. The people who know me and I've listened to the show get it. But I think, depending on whose guru I'm listening to, I probably violated some rules. In fact, I'd love your feedback. Well, the coffee and space definitely, I mean, the, the space part tells me either it's sci fi or it's like astro yeah. physics or whatever there. Yeah. And that. I think it's safe. The coffee and I guess you kind of have to be in the genre. I, you know, being a sci-fi fan myself and a reader, I would have to say that it speaks to me. I don't know yeah. if I would immediately jumps out to me. Maybe you can put coffee in space and then like pull in like a science fiction. Ooh, I like that author podcast yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, something like yeah, that. I might, I might workshop that a little bit. You offered to let me ask questions, and I don't know that you knew what you were getting into there. <laughs> this is the sort of thing I've wanted for a while. I did that with Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, it's been through various different names over the course of the years. Now, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a podcast that was originally started to cover the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show, which was a Marvel Cinematic Universe show that was on ABC at the time. Since then, we've expanded that to just the general Marvel Cinematic Universe, predominantly focused on Marvel Studios. So it's uh, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. colon a Marvel Studios fan podcast is mm -hmm. what I've evolved to over the years. And it's, like I said, it's been different things, but that colon and that further explanation mm -hmm. helps. The problem is then it's not just the simple tagline of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. In your right. case, Coffee in Space. It's yeah. Coffee in Space a science fiction author interview. Yeah, that could go out of control pretty quick if I'm not careful. Yeah, but but the title is one of the things, one of the few things that is indexed and searched by several places like Apple Podcasts, which yep. is the, where the majority of people get their podcasts from, whether it's from Apple Podcasts or from one of the places that pull mm -hmm. from their API. So that kind of works in your benefit to be a little bit descriptive 
in the title. I know various different people that do television show review podcasts make sure that they put the name of the show yeah, in that makes their sense. show. So, yeah. Well, I'm really grateful for the guy I got. And I just, I just used a, a artist on Fiverr because um, uh, I was just starting out on shoestring. In fact, we can talk about that type of situation later if you want. But the artwork for the podcast does, I mean, there's a cup of coffee floating in orbit around a planet and that kind of helps frame it a little bit. Although there is still like, is it going to be science or is it going to be science fiction? But, but I did like the art that, that uh, was there for my show. So was this a pandemic project? Yeah, there's a little bit more to that. But the truth is the pandemic gave me the option and the opportunity to start it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was Coffee in Space your first podcast or did you have previous experience? Yeah, it is my first podcast. And I'll just say I am a writer first. Like if I'm ranking my hobbies, I'm a writer first. And then I'm a podcaster, or at least that's what I want it to be. And so I was in the process of learning how to be a better writer and listening to some podcasts on that. And there's a particular podcast called Novel Marketing Podcast by Thomas Umstead Jr., who was saying, if you're trying to build an audience for your writing, that you could do it through podcasting. And this is still 2019, late 2019, early 2020, just right before the pandemic. And so I started thinking, well, could I do that? Maybe. Do I want to? Yes, I want to do all things that get me in front of people. And so uh, the pandemic gave me that opportunity once that came. So you're running two hobbies at the same time. I mean, a lot of people do right. a lot of yeah. hobbies, whatever. What would you say your percentages are, or if you have hours, you can throw that at it too, but your percentages are of every week, how much you spend in writing versus how much you spend on your podcast? That's also a good question. And I wish I was organized enough to be able to give you a true breakdown. It comes in waves. And so like right now, because of my day job, I'm having to schedule a lot of my podcasts. So I'm doing not quite batch recording where I'm doing a, an episode every night to get ready for a lot of editing coming up, but I'm pretty close to that situation. And so I'm putting off my writing and my editing of the writing until late March, early April, when I've got time to focus on that based on my work schedule. And so it's not necessarily a how much is broken up inside the week. It's usually more about what am I doing that week? Is it writing or is it podcasting? Okay. So... You mentioned you're basically batch recording and, and getting episodes out. How often do you publish? I try to be weekly. And this is another thing that I wish I had known when I had started out. Or, or is a thing that I wish I knew when I started out is how to better manage my production schedule. And in three years, I have not figured that out. I should learn that better. I try to publish weekly with some breaks built in and then i will try and let people know when those breaks happen they you know christmas to early into the next year i take some time off and then sporadically throughout yeah i don't know if you heard Stephen and i on our other podcast but we were talking about the holiday time and, and how we've been trying to manage that over the course of the years and it's been on the advice of professional podcasters that are like you, you need a new episode in the feed every week every week every week so we bust our butts trying to pre-record and only take one week off during the holidays. But the episodes right before happen to be like special episodes that take more time to produce. And it's right in the middle of that busy season. And the, it's not just busy because of the actual holidays. You got a lot of stuff going on at work. Steven's got a lot of stuff going on at the end of the year with his kids, with school. You have just stuff to get ready for the holidays. Steven and I both decorate for the holidays. So we have to take time off for that sort of stuff. So this coming December, we're going to do something different. We're going to take more time off. I don't know what that's going to look like right now, but we are planning on taking time at that point. And what we've found over the years is that the downloads go down. So the number yes. of people that are available to listen to your shows go down. Now there's a hardcore fandom on any show. You know, if you have 30 listeners, it might be two or three people. If you have 3000, it might be a few hundred. 
that are going to want your content every week, they can wait or you can throw an old episode in your feed and they can just remember. Because a lot of people back in the day when we first started podcasting, Stephen and I, people would just stack all their episodes on their iPod. So they would keep all of them. Nowadays, with your podcatcher, you just download the episode and then when you listen to it, it gets automatically deleted or you delete it or whatever. Now you can keep, you know, you can modify that. But mo- that's how most people do it. So if you put an old episode back in your feed that is timely and speaks to whatever is going on in the world at that point in time, and then you put a forward and a back end of it, I think your hardcore audience will be fine with that. But yeah, that's one of the things that throughout the year you got to take breaks, especially if you're a solo podcaster, because it's your time and it's your time out of work. So I don't think anybody can blame me. And your episodes are what about half an hour to 45 minutes. I try and keep them uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So having that, so you're recording for that amount of time plus set up and tear down or or connecting on, on both ends with somebody. Mm -hmm. And then you got to go in and edit and that takes time too. So it just, it all takes time and eats into your available time. Yeah. Yeah. That brings up another question I was going to ask you is I went into your feeds and I was going to take a look at all the podcasts that you did. And I could only find, from I believe it was from episode 84 to your current episode. I forget if it was 109 or 110 or something yeah. like that. So it's basically the last 25 or so episodes and that's all you make yeah, available. So I, I made a mistake. This is something for everyone to learn from. If you're just getting started. I use Buzzsprout as my host. And so I set it to the last 30 episodes. They're all there. If you went into it, if you go to my website, you can see links to a lot of the older ones. But I only set it to the last 30. Here's the problem. The problem is if I go in there right now and say publish all episodes, everyone who's already been listening to the show for a long time then suddenly gets dumped another 100 episodes. I learned that the hard way when one of my longtime listeners and friends reached out and said, you know, it's been great. I got to listen to a lot of old episodes that took me down memory lane, but you kind of clogged up my phone there for a little bit. And so I try to respect my listeners as much as I can. So, you know, I'll mention them and I'll link to them if there is a relevant episode from back in the day. So that's the biggest reason why you only saw the last 25 to 30 episodes. The other one is, as I get better, there's not a lot of worth going back into some of those. Like if someone downloaded all 100 and I think 11 as of this morning, 30, 40, maybe 50 are my good ones. And then after that, you learn that I wasn't always good at this. (laughs) everybody's got to start somewhere yeah. now there's definitely different ways to do that i mean if you don't if you don't want them in your feed you know don't have them in your feed i would definitely make them available through your website somehow yeah. for somebody yeah. that comes along and wants to go back and listen to all of them the other thing that you could do if you would want to make it bigger is you just go into the bud sprout back in and increase that it's in the settings somewhere mm-hmm. I, I don't know specifically where because i don't use bud sprout but every other podcast media host provider that i've used you just go in and every time you publish an episode you just increase it by one. Oh, that's a good idea it would take like two years to get that 84 yeah. episodes out but then eventually they would go out and you wouldn't clog the phone up yeah and effectively you'd be publishing two episodes a that's week a good, that's a good idea so you could try that for a little while see yeah, like if that any of your listeners come back at you and say they don't like it if they do then you know just make sure they're available on the website with legends of shield there are the first 13 episodes i believe that are not available on the rss feed Mm. the reason for that is that there was a whole other group of hosts that did those episodes and they were kind of getting bored with the show because it was before the big turn the big transition with uh winter soldier Mm. Yeah, no, Civil War. It was the one where Hydra became known, right? Mm. So that happened at like episode 17 or so. And the episodes up to that point was simply just getting to that point of the yeah. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. show. So the original host, quite frankly, got bored and, and they had a lot on their plate. And they're like, we don't want to do this anymore. So the guy who owned the show said, hey, you want it? And I said, sure, I'll take it. 
So he gave it to me and then I took it and then made some improvements or whatever. But because we made it a clean show at that point and they were obviously not clean, I'm like, I don't want the listeners to come in yep. and I have to listen to that. Yep. So I just made them not available now they're available on the website but they're not available on the rss feed so mm, that's a good idea yeah so what besides the pandemic and your love for sci-fi if there is anything inspired you to start the show uh well it does go back to the writing so i had gotten to know some writers on twitter and facebook um, just as i was trying to better my writing and you know, kind of dawned on me that this is a good way to get to know other writers. People want to, I mean, they need a way to talk about their book and, uh, or writing processes. And so I learned, or I realized that I could learn a lot from them if I would just have them on my show. And so I learned a ton about world building that fed into my writing. I learned a ton about plotting. And so, you know, it still revolved around podcasting and writing, but it kind of evolved a little bit into also getting to know other people in the wider writing author community. And so, uh, in fact, now I would say it's more about that than the others. I've learned enough. My writing still has a long way to go, by the way, but I've learned enough to get it moving. And so now it's more about building those relationships and just enjoying the, the talk with other authors. That's part of the why I like doing this show is I get to talk to other podcasters yeah. and see what they're doing and what they're, what I'm not doing and what might work. Like just last episode, I was talking to Jeff about how they made a success for themselves on YouTube. And he yeah. was mentioning the tags. I had originally used tags in my episodes years ago, but I heard that they're not being used anymore. So the use of them went away. But then I started using them again, and I kind of noticed a little uptick just in the last week mm. on the episodes that I published on YouTube. So maybe there's still a thing for those tags. We'll see. We'll see long term. YouTube is something I would like to someday learn, although I'm so late to the game, I don't know that it would matter. But, uh, it, you know, the funny thing about what, <laughs> what Jeff said last week, uh, and I listened to it this morning slash yesterday, and uh, when you asked him what is he not liking about the industry or whatever? He's like, there's too many interview shows. And I'm like, ah, uh, <laughs> yes, I am one of those. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. And you know, this is essentially, I mean, we talk about it being a conversation, but I, you can think of it in terms of interview yeah. show. Like, thanks Jeff for saying that on my show. Yeah. Thanks. We appreciate it. Well, since you brought that up, I was going to bring it up later, but what is one of your gripes of the industry? If you have any, you know, I don't have a lot. One of the things that does annoy me, and it has nothing to do with the industry itself, it's the hangers honors that try and take advantage of small time people like me or people getting started. And that's just the, like in a Facebook group or in a Discord, probably, I don't know, I don't use Discord quite as much, but in a Facebook group, especially, you might post a question to the community about podcasting and you get like 10 messages from people or comments in there about, you know, I can take your podcast from zero to, you know, a billion people listening. And they're almost all not true. If you did a little research, if you do a little research and you can do it pretty quickly, but it clogs it up and it frustrates me because there might be real people also commenting that can help uh, the new person out or or help me out even as a little more experienced podcaster but it gets lost in the noise because of course social media has lots of noise and so it's not the industry itself for that one it's the people who are trying to take advantage of uh, new folks like you know just getting started and small timers like me hobby podcasters like me who who just want to grow. I mean, we all just want to grow probably. I mean, I'd, I'd love to have another however many listeners, of course, but I want to do it that they're real and I want them to be a part of a community. I don't want, you know, junk bots or whatever. The only other thing that kind of goes along those lines is I wish there was a little bit more emphasis like what your show is doing. 
I wish it was okay to be a hobby podcaster. And a lot of people will say it's okay, but then they immediately turn to how to grow. I wish it was a little more okay to be a hobby podcaster. And maybe you to disagree with me on that. I'm not sure. Not at all. I've had conversations with people in the industry just about that. And there's there's people in those circles that might not be the actual professionals in there that say, don't call my show a hobby podcast because it minimizes what I yeah. do. Well, you are not a hobby podcast. You are obviously doing a business. And I respect that. There is a role for a business show or an entrepreneur show or a independent podcaster that's trying to make ends meet with their show. There is a role for that in podcasting. I don't disagree with that. What I disagree with is the minimizing or the poo-pooing of the hobbyist. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, as far as the social media stuff, mm. I will offer that it's not necessarily the social media or even the people coming in. I would say it would be the moderation, the scale of moderation. That's true. Yeah. In fact, yeah. One of the groups I'm in is getting better about that specifically because of the recent influx of ne'er-do-wells. So that's true. Yeah. So I'm moderator of a couple of Discord servers. Uh, I'm a moderator of the R Podcasting subreddit. Oh, yeah. And we have put in rules specifically so that it maintains good cordial conversation. Even if people disagree, you know, as long as, as long as you're nice to each other or whatever. And then of course there's everybody coming in trying to sell. And so we've had to make rules just to make the place usable because if we didn't, then it would just turn into this ever loving, you know, uh, one post after another, after a comment, after a post, after a comment. And, and it's just, it's not good for the space to have those conversations. There are other subreddits about the podcasting space that either aren't as well moderated or as they are podcasting, or they just don't have the same level of moderation. And you go in there and there's a bunch of junk. They eventually, some of them eventually will get to it, but it's like the first 20 or 30 posts is yeah. all like promotion stuff. I'm like, okay, I get it, but I don't, I need something that's stripped of all that because i don't have the time to wade through that agreed yeah absolutely i'll say that i i probably not a podcasting space issue probably more of a moderation social media sort of issue yeah i agree with that so what excites you about podcasting? i mean you get to talk to all these authors i assume that's a, a big excitement <laughs> you get to learn about how they world build and whatever i mean is mm. that the excitement that you have with it it's a big part of it it's, you know, I get free books too. I have to, I mean, that's a perk. That's a huge perk. I don't like all of them, but I, I like, you know, several of them. And so I like getting them. So that's part of it. And then, uh, I will say, and I got a text this morning from someone who I, I happen to know, but the individual wrote me a text and said, thanks. Now I went and bought another book. And, uh, and I was like, how's that my fault? And you're, and, uh, the person's like, you know, well, you had a great guest on and I liked the idea of the book. So I went and bought it and I'm like, well, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> and so like, and I've gotten a couple of those types of texts or messages where someone I know or don't know says, Hey, thanks for recommending that book. Or thanks for having that person on, or thanks for asking that question. I love getting those too. And so that's really become a lot of the excitement is interactions that I'm now starting to have as I grow just a little bit with people that have been listening to the show. And I've also gotten a, not just to talk to the authors that are coming on the show, but also in the aftermath when their episode is out, they've maybe braved it. And a lot of people don't want to hear their own voice. I don't know if you struggled with that or not when you first got started, but a lot of people don't want to, especially introverted authors. But I'll get a text or an email from an author that says, hey, I appreciate what you did for my book. It really meant a lot to me. And that's, that's really cool. I mean, everybody wants to matter, right? And so it's kind of nice to have that happen. So it's, it's getting to know the authors, it's learning about writing. But again, it goes back to those connections with guests, with listeners. It's just awesome. Awesome to hear. That's great that you're able to have that type of impact on the space from introducing people to content to actually helping other people out. That's great. That's a lot of fun. 
It's not on the grand scale that, I mean, I'm, I, I meant to say this earlier. I'm the hobbyist of hobbyist podcasts. I really am. But it is nice to get those texts every now and then. Yeah, just like back in the day, I know it was nice to get uh, reviews. I don't focus on yep. that too much anymore. But if you know, come in, review the show, that means a lot to any podcaster. Yeah, I actually I'm very judicious about doing it. But if I'm enjoying a show, I will go in and I will review the show and I will yep. give it a, a five star and I will go wherever I think their audience is more because some audiences are bigger, like on Spotify or whatever. And I will try to leave a review wherever. I think would make the biggest difference for them and uh, you know, just give it an uplift or whatever. I try to do at least once a month, but you know, sometimes life gets in the way always. So you mentioned that your first episodes weren't very good and you only have about 50 years. So the episodes that are good, what have you done specifically or what have you noticed that you've improved on since you started? Well, a lot of it is confidence talking to people who are where I want to be. So because I was an aspiring writer, I kind of always had, well, and some of them I just flat admitted that it was a fanboy moment. I think I might have done that with David Brin, but Derek Kunskin, who's a sci-fi author, pretty well known uh, in the community. And then several others, I was just, honestly, I was just so enamored with the fact that I was getting to talk to somebody who was so far ahead of me, or even just a little bit ahead of me. And doing so much better in the writing space that I think I I danced around issues a lot because I didn't want to you know bother anyone and I just wanted to show them my gratitude and so we would just we would just kind of talk surface level I wouldn't get too deep into it and I wouldn't really try and get to to know them at a level where my listeners would want to know them and so I think in the last probably since Andy Weir was on the show for episode 50, I think I really finally started opening it up, enjoying it a little bit more. And so I think it's all about the interview. The interview has gotten better. My pacing's gotten better. Slowly, I'm getting a format that works. That's taken a long time to kind of figure out. But I'd say the biggest thing is I've learned to open up the interviews and just kind of have some fun with it. They're just other people on the other end, of course. I know, ever so theoretically. (laughs) Of course, some of them have some complexes that they want to be pandered to and everything. So, yeah, I get that. But they're just other people. So I just treat them like other people myself. Sometimes that hits, sometimes it misses. There was one interviewee that we had on Voices Defiance, which was my very first podcast, that we had a tough time to get started on. Very adversarial to start off with. And we slowly ate away at the guest to the point at the end, the guest was very happy to have been with us because I don't know what kind of story that he had gotten about podcasts back in the day. So this is earlier on in podcasts, yeah. like 2013 time frame or something like that. And podcasts weren't as well known. So probably had some preconceived notions going into it, but the guest at the end was very complimentary and We had some interactions with the guests afterwards and it was good, but yeah, to just sit down, treat them like humans, Mm -hmm. have fun. I think that's pretty cool. I went into our discord server, which you can find at betterpodcasting.com slash discord. I said that you were going to come on. I said what your show was and what you do. And I asked if there were any questions. Mm -hmm. One of my co-hosts on legends of shield, he goes by waffles. His name is Chris. He asked two questions, and one of the questions, since you brought up your guests, was how do you find time to read the books before the interview? Okay, so here's confession time, and I, I think I've been open enough about this uh, in previous episodes where I've either been a guest on someone's show or I've talked about it on my own. I don't. I don't read them all. And so I know that's, there are, there are shows that do. And, uh, and I bow to them. I am upfront with an author before I start talking to them where I am in their book. I try and get at least a third of the way through. Uh, I'm not a super fast reader anyway, so it really speaks to the, the problem that I have when I'm trying to do batch, batch recording especially. So I'll try and get about a third of the story through. That's about as far as I want to talk anyway before we get into spoiler territory where things are starting to really happen. And so I'll just let the author know where I'm at. And most are gracious. I had one who demanded that I read the book first, so I did. 
it was not even that, in my opinion, that, you know, great of a story. It didn't really resonate with me, but we did the interviews. It was painful. And kind of like what you mentioned earlier with uh, the guest you're talking about, except we did not end it super well either. It's one of those that won't make the website. Uh, and then when I went to see if uh, the individual wanted to come back on later, I demanded that I read the book, the next book. And I did. We got delayed. Demand I read the next book. And I was like, I'm out. This isn't, this isn't working anymore. And so, and if I can't read it at all because I'm doing batch recording or because the publicist has asked me to make this happen, I'm again up front with the author. I don't pretend that I did. I will ask them, you know, they can share spoilers with me even if I don't share them on the show. And, and so that I know I'm not asking dumb questions. We just go from there. So the, the short answer is I don't find time to read all the books because I don't read all the books. I can definitely see that. I wouldn't be able to read all the books because yeah. I'm a slow reader. I'm still trying to Me get too. through the first book of Wheel of Time. So I do. <laughs> just, I'm just still waiting through that. And season two is coming up really soon on Amazon Prime. And I want to read the book and watch season one. I, yeah. I've watched a few episodes, but I, I stopped and I want to read the book and then go back. So, yeah, I get it. Totally get it. Yeah. It, it doesn't stop me from respecting the author or the character. And so, like, you know, and I hope this comes through the recording. My intention, as far as relating to the author, is I want to have the conversation about the science fiction and fantasy characters we love and the journeys they take. And if I didn't get a time to read the entire book and I'm open and honest with it, and the author is open and honest with their expectations, then we are going to have a great conversation anyway. And I'm going to get to learn a lot about the author. And so there are ways, if, if anyone out there is listening and they're just getting kind of started and they're wondering how in the world could I do an author interview podcast if I can't read fast or I, I just don't read everything that gets a, if it doesn't get a hold of me, the truth is it's about respecting the author and the characters that they wrote about. And if you can do that and you're honest about it, you can have a good podcast. Do you, most of the guests come from you reaching out to them or do you have guests that reach out to you? When I first started out, it was all me reaching out, but I did reach out to a couple of publicists early on. One was because the author introduced me to his publicist, but the other one was just, I reached out kind of cold calling. I said, I had a podcast. I didn't mention reach. I didn't mention how many downloads I was getting back then. I just said, I had a podcast. It was 2020. No one had anything else going on with their lives because we were all hunkering down. And uh, a lot of people had or were getting microphones. And so a lot of people were just willing to come on. So I'd either reach out to them directly or to a, a publicist. And, and now, after almost three years and 100 plus episodes, people are reaching out to me. I've always had indie writers reaching out to me because they kind of do everything on their own. But when it comes to traditionally published authors, it's usually me reaching out to the author or through a publicist. And once you set that interview, you say you batch record, mm -hmm. how do you connect with everybody? Is it through Zoom or is it through some sort of communication protocol or how do you connect with other authors? We start their email almost exclusively. Most authors don't ask for a pre-interview and I don't ask for one either because we just spend the first 10 minutes or so getting to know each other and then we go into the recording. So that's the, we'll start through email and our communication. And then I did use Zoom for a very long time. The first 90 episodes or better are all via Zoom. I, based on finances at the time, switched to Zencaster. So now I am pretty exclusively using Zencaster. I've used Skype before. Uh, for those who need a free option, Skype's available. Uh, it's probably not pro level, but, and maybe you can tell me which one of those I did recently that was uh, over Skype, but most people aren't going to be able to tell which one that is. So Skype introduces a lot of hiss unless you're at the yeah. professional level. So we usually have to take that out if we're forced to connect that way in post by using noise reduction so i can usually when i'm connect heck this is one of the reasons why we left skype to begin with because that's how we connected we use the ndi from yeah. skype we threw it into a program whether it was obs or x split and then we would 
go and and uh, record that way. But when Skype started introducing all this audio hiss, if there was a time where our local recordings were down, then we would have to use the recording that we got through Skype. And it was just degraded to the point where like, no, we need to find something else. And that's honestly starting down the path that we did that we found Video Ninja. Mm. It's a little bit more technical. It's not as user-friendly. Well, it's user-friendly to the person on the other end. They just click on the link, but it's not as user-friendly mm. to you. And it provides an amazing connection very clear video the audio was pretty good so if you're forced to use that audio it's pretty good too i don't think they do local recordings like right now we're using Streamyard, and i'm yeah. using the local audio recordings as mm-hmm. backup i'm recording on my roadcaster pro 2 but i'm using the Streamyard local recordings and they've turned out pretty well i've had a couple of issues there my one question to you with zencaster have you experienced either a loss of files or an extreme sync issue between the two tracks since you started using it? I haven't. Maybe I haven't used it enough. I've actually been impressed that when I thought I had a bad connection with an author I was interviewing recently, Zencaster was picking up more of our interview than I thought it was. And so I actually have experienced a little bit of the opposite. But that probably is, I have heard things like that. I have not experienced them. The questions, okay. the questions I ask and the answers the author give match up pretty well. Okay. So you record that and then you take your files and mm. you throw them into a DAW. Which DAW are you using? Hindenburg. So I, that was a recommendation from the host of Novel Marketing Podcast, Thomas Umstead Jr. That's what I think he was using at the time. So I'm a Hinder- Hindenburg user. But I think I started with GarageBand back when I had a MacBook. I don't have a MacBook now. So I use Hindenburg. I actually just got approved for their new beta launch. Uh, I have not yet started using it. It's supposed to allow a little quicker transcription process, which I'm not super big on anyway. So it'll just be fun to play with. Damien in our Discord server is trying it out right now. Yeah. Okay. And he's been having some issues and he's been pointing out some nice stuff. So. Yeah. If you'd like to, you can join the Discord and have... Yeah, I think I might do that. Yeah, that's great. Conversation to our heart's content with Damien. He's really been putting it through its paces. That's great. I talked to the Hindenburg guys at Podcast Movement 2021, I think it was. And I was impressed by them as a team. I was impressed with their product. I dabbled with their product before. I've never really used it as my main DAW, so I can't speak to it. I can just say... I've heard great things about it. People that have used it have had great things about it. And uh, it's one that I would not hesitate to recommend. So I'm glad you're having fun using it. And who do you use? Right now I'm using Vegas Pro 19 or Vegas Edit 19, I think it's called. It's from the Vegas Pro line as it has moved forward. It's both a video editor and an audio DAW. So I can put the VSTs in there, like my RX 9 standard. It's a 9 standard, I think. I think I bought 10. Anyway, I put all those VSTs in there, all those effects, and I'm able to treat it just like an audio DAW. I know Reaper, I threatened to use that quite a bit. My co-host on Better Podcasting, Steven, he's been using DaVinci Resolve lately. Mm -hmm. We're going to go into that in a future show. But uh, he said, yeah, for a hobbyist, this DaVinci Resolve is... It's pretty good. And I believe DaVinci Resolve also has like a, a mobile version. So you can oh, use it on a nice. tablet. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So that's been working out well. There's a lot of great editors out there. I know a lot of people have had issues with Audacity and like privacy or the fact that it's no longer truly freeware or shareware or something like that. Audacity is always a free one to say, like, if you're talking about, starting on a shoestring budget maybe you should have that conversation now yeah garage band and audacity are always at the forefront right i would argue that it would be one thing that you don't want to totally skimp on so you might want to do like reaper or one of the more inexpensive like davinci resolve or something like that what would you think starting out would you recommend garage band i know it's venerable well i i'd say if you have a macbook garage band's an easy win if you're starting on a shoestring 
it's not too hard to to learn, especially if you've played around with any audio work on a MacBook before. And it gets the job done. My first few episodes were published that way. But I would follow that up with, uh, first of all, if you don't have a Mac, I don't know that I'd agree with Audacity. I know that there's the benefit of the free is a hard price to beat. But because you want to be able, you, when you're editing a podcast, when I'm editing a podcast, I'll speak in I statements on that. But when I'm editing a podcast, I need it to be pretty easy and I need there not to be any questions about it. And I've just heard enough about Audacity that makes me worry about that a little bit. So I, I've heard good things about Reaper and some of the others that you mentioned. And so I would, and then of course, I highly recommend Hindenburg because I've been using it for over two years. I just think you should spend a little bit of money if you have to put your money there and get uh, that in the microphone and, and really you're good to go. Now, it looks like you're using a USB XLR microphone like the Samsung Q2U or maybe the Audio-Technica ATR2100? The Samsung? Or- it is 100% the Samsung Q2U. Yeah. Samsung Q2U. I think that's an amazing value because you can connect via USB. And although I've heard there's gain issues on the USB and I've experienced some of the gain issues, I have one too. I have an Audio-Technica ATR2100 as well. Mm. The gain is always less than what I can get through an audio interface or a, a recorder mixer or something like that. But the bonus is it also has XLR so that when you make that jump right. to a yes. recorder or a audio interface or something like that, you can, you don't have to buy a new microphone. You have the microphone. Right. So I'll say on the shoestring. And now when I started, the Samsung Q2U was sold out everywhere. Like that was one of the first things because all the businesses and all the schools, they all went online. Samsung Q2U was sold out everywhere. It was back ordered like six months on Sweetwater, which I think is where I ended up buying it, you know, on back order or whatever. And so I had to start out with a, I don't say had to start. I started out with a friend's Yeti snowball mic. And it's just, you know, another plug and play type of mic. It's just the difference between a condenser and a dynamic mic. I recommend the dynamic mic for people who don't have nice setups, uh, pretty simple setups. It's a, uh, the dynamic mic, Samsung Q2U is a pretty easy one. I know the audio technic is good too. So I started that way because there weren't any available, but as soon as I could upgrade there, I went that way and I went USB because I don't, when I'm not making a bunch of money off the podcast and I am truly just having chats with people about their books and the characters and whatnot. I don't need a lot more. Like my dream is to get a Rodecaster Pro. My dream is to uh, have the mic that you're using right now, but I'm just not there yet. And I know that I could sound better and even more clear than I think I do. But the reality is where I'm at right now and where someone might be at if they're just starting out with with a hobby that they may even want to turn into a business someday, this is pretty good. I'll admit it's it's really good. I started out with a, I don't know, $50 mixer. It was a Behringer 802 USB mixer. Started out with a a, a cheap, they come in three packs and they were like, I don't know, 20 or 30 bucks. It was the Behringer 1300S microphones. Mm. So, I, I mean, I still have them. I'm, I'm trying to get rid of them right now, but it, they're still in the cabinet behind me. And I sounded okay. Now, going back, I sound better with the setup that I have now, but that's mostly for me. I sounded clear, intelligible. There was no echo. There was plosives in there, but I learned how to control that eventually. Yes, cheap is good. Nowadays, I could say, well, If I was really starting from scratch, I would advocate, there's no need for it. You can do it with the Samsung Q2U, but I would advocate a PodTrack P4 and a, you pick the microphone. It depends on what your budget is. It could be as simple as the Behringer XM8500, which is about a $20 microphone. Could be the Samsung Q2U, could be like the Rode Pod mic or something like that. Really depends on your budget. We're finding that the Zoom ZDM1 is an amazing oh, nice value at $50 because it's pod mic style, but it's like half the price. Yeah. So 
Yeah, the uh, PodTrack P4 is on my shopping list. The Scarlet is at the 2i2. I think that's on my shopping list. Things that I would like to upgrade to. Uh, definitely getting back in, getting to an XLR recording system would be a goal of mine. Again, it just comes down to what's easy with my busy schedule and what makes me sound. I don't want to say good enough because the truth is that's not good enough. I don't want to sound good enough. But what makes me sound clear and concise and capable? And if you're just starting out, that's really what you need. You definitely sound better than listenable using your setup. In my opinion, you could use that for your entire career of podcasting and you'd be fine. Yeah. So if you could have told yourself one thing Mm -hmm. to make your podcasting easier when you started in March of 2020, what would you have told yourself? That I didn't have to take every breath and um out of my recording in the editing. And so, and I know, by the way, because I know how to count them, that I've said, I think, in the 20s or dozens of ums on this episode, and I hope you will edit some of them out when you go to do your final. But the fact is, is I had gotten to the point in some of those recordings where I was editing all dead space, I was editing all ums, all breaths. It sounded like a canned recording where I was reading from a script and the author was reading from a script and we weren't having a real conversation because in real conversations, there are pauses while the person tries to think of what they want to say. There's pauses when the host wants to ask a follow-up question. There's pauses, there's, there's ums because our minds want to, I think you talked about it in a previous episode. There's ums when you, you're trying to think about what you want to say next and that's part of natural conversation. And while we don't want to go overboard with it, I had gone overboard the other direction where I was just taking everything out and it really didn't sound natural in the end. And also it takes a lot of time. That's a lot of time spent in editing. I wish I hadn't worked quite so hard on that. The The payoff wasn't there. Uh, I wish also, as I say, in, uh, that I had accepted my place as a hobbyist a long time ago. That's kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, where I wish it was more okay and more acceptable to be a hobbyist. Because had I realized that, I wouldn't have burned myself out in late last year trying to scramble for every listener that I could get my hands on or my microphone on. I don't know how you say that, but I wish I had just wanted to have fun with this a long time ago, like I did when I started, but I left that and that was to my shame. It's one of the big things that Stephen and I harp on in the Better Podcasting Main Show just about every episode. Make sure you have fun. That's our number yep. one thing. Make sure, as a hobbyist, passion podcaster, it will get you through a lot of stuff. Just make sure you have fun. Absolutely. Some weeks will be funner than others, but yep. it is what it is. So talking about growth, is there anything that you've done along the way that has specifically helped your growth that you'd like to share? So the biggest thing for me, and that only applies to people who interview pe- other people, so an interview podcast. I stopped relying on my guests to grow my show for me. And once I did that, my numbers, I mean, so it, it just depends. Like sometimes I'd have an author on that would share it vigorously and, and they had a great following. And so that episode and episodes around it would have higher download numbers. But that would peter back out because those people were only there to listen to their guy or gal, their author. And once I realized that, first of all, stop putting the strain on the famous people or the up and coming people to grow my show for me, that's strain that doesn't belong there. And it's disappointment when it doesn't happen. And just start working on building an audience that that's there because of the questions I ask and the people I talk to. And so I think one of the biggest things I've stopped doing is expecting other people to do the work for me. Yeah, it is a solo endeavor or if you're with a team it is the team's yeah. endeavor oftentimes teams off in podcasting depend on one person so it does come down to one person yeah, even that. with a team yeah. uh, sometimes but yeah i, I would uh, heartily agree with that i've never depended on guests to grow a show but at the same time i mean the content behind the guests right so you have to get that as part of your show to grow it so yeah i like that have fun and and uh just get to the content. That's two yep. great tips right there. 
So you've been podcasting for uh, three years now. It's March yep. 2023. Oh, three yeah, years actually, now. yeah, actually three. Happy anniversary to me, I guess. Happy third anniversary. Yeah. If you could pick one moment, it doesn't have to be the one, but you know, the one that comes to mind right now, if you had a favorite moment of your show over the past three years, that you're just thinking about like, oh, that was so cool. I have many, by the way, for me. Yeah, but yeah, sure. What would be one that you would pick? When Andy Weir's publicist wrote me back and said, yes, he'll come on your show. <laughs> that was it. That was it. And that was a long time ago now. So like, I, I don't know that I can really count it anymore, but he was my first. And honestly, he's still the biggest writer I ever had on the, the show. I've had, I've gotten close to a couple of others, but he's the biggest and he was a great guest. His publicist was great to work for or work with, I guess. And it was amazing. And getting that email that day, just, I don't know, my heart just started palpitating. It was great. I can't wait to listen to the episode. I was looking for it. Of course, it's hidden because it yeah, was episode uh, 50. You know what? I think it's one of those that I need to get up on the website. So once I get it, I'll send it to you. Okay, thanks. All right. We did have a question in the live chat. I don't want to ignore it right now, but uh, William Eckel asked the question, we, and this was back when we were talking about when you were, if you were reading books, do you prefer audio books? William Eckel, by the way, I know of that fella, and I am glad that he joined us tonight. So William, that's a great question. I want you to ask that in the Facebook group, by the way, because I, I think it's good to get other people to chime in. But I don't. I want to read, I need to read, or at least where I'm at now, I need to read the story in the, the voices in my head. <laughs> I have a lot of voices in my head. And, uh, and so I need to read it in the way those voices come out. And usually, unless you get a real true performance, the majority of those episodes or the 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 voices are all going to be voiced by one person and so the really good ones and there are plenty of good audiobook narrators voice actors they'll have different voices for the different characters but i need i kind of need just to have them all in my own head so i like reading it it's to my detriment i would get through a lot more books if i listened to audiobooks well, William, I'm going to answer that question too, because it's a great question. And I do enjoy audiobooks. As a matter of fact, in that bookshelf behind me, if you're watching the video, I do have some cassette tape audiobooks from oh, like the 80s school. and the 90s. Yeah. Nice. That I was listening to in the car. But honestly, I don't have time for it because the time that I would spend listening to audiobooks, I'm listening to podcasts now. Yep. So I really just don't have the time for it. And one of my co hosts on uh, another show, Sean, he prefers listening to audiobooks than to reading. He still reads, but he prefers to listen to audiobooks and he listens to it in the car as he's commuting or whatever. I just don't do that. I, I listen yeah. to podcasts at my desk, at work, when I get the chance. And when, when I can put on headphones and listen to podcasts, I'll do that. Or if I'm in the car, I'm going to listen to podcasts, but I do enjoy a good audiobook. I will say that. A lot of the audio dramas out there are mm. very much like an audiobook, and I do listen to those. So that's kind of a yes, I guess, for you. But no, I don't listen. I don't intentionally listen to audiobooks. I listen to podcasts. So thank you, William, very much for that question. I look forward to hearing everybody else's answers on it on your Facebook yeah, group. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Speaking of that, you had a. a guy on a voice actor and I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now you may uh, remember it quickly it's from i think last year but where he started by listening to uh night vale and i had one of the authors of the night vale uh, drama series on and and uh it was a great chat and those types of things that is a really good way to listen to stories when there's a full production and they've done a good job on it yeah I've had several people that have done audio dramas uh, and, and one's a, one in particular was a voice actor. And I think that's who you're referring to, but yeah. I've had several, so I'm not, I'm not yeah. going to pin the tail on the donkey on anybody there. <laughs> that's wise. Cause I think even from the very first episode on when I've had somebody talking about audiobooks, more than likely they or audio dramas. They mostly mention night fail. Vale. Yeah. So is there anything else that you want to talk about about hobby podcasting tonight? Well, I'll ask you a question. 
how do you have time for so many projects? You've got like, so I, confession time again, I, I love confession time. I've started three podcasts and one of them is still going. I just don't have the time, energy, a wherewithal. Maybe it's a lack of ambition as well, but how do you have time to do all the projects you're doing? First of all, it comes down to the team that I was yeah. mentioned before. I don't do everything on all the podcasts, that's for sure. If you go back to the Better Podcasting Main Show, it's episode 50, so you can find it at betterpodcasting.com slash 50. We talked, uh, Stephen and I talked about the golden rules of hobby podcasting. There was like 15 of them. The one rule out of those 15 that gets referred to over and over again is my rule that if you're doing a hobby podcast, you should not do more than two a week. Mm. That is because there is no way that on your spare time, you can keep up with life, record, prepare, produce, and market all the same. No, you can't. Matter of fact, I would argue, I was telling Stephen this earlier this year, I think we're down to one now mm. with all the promotion that you have to do on social media and everything because there are more and more podcasts. You have to stand out. You have to promote more. And I feel that's a failing of my own is that I haven't been promoting as much as I should. And I've explored getting different uh, podcast community managers to take over some social media or definitely have co-hosts take them over. And it just does not, well, first of all, all my co-hosts have access to the community accounts for the mm. podcast. So anybody can go in on all my shows and, and use the accounts. Yeah, I don't have that under lock and key. If you're a co-host of mine, you have access to the accounts. So that sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. How I'm able to do it. First of all, I've been doing this for 10 years, more than 10 years. I've been doing this for 13 years. So I'm pretty adept at the editing. It still takes me a while. Like a, a normal one hour podcast with two to three co-hosts will take me five hours to edit. And that's video and audio, but it takes yeah. me about five hours to get through. So not only do I have to prepare in, in the case of it, like a TV show, I have to watch the episode multiple times. Yep. I have to make notes and then I have to record. That's another hour. And then I'm editing it, which is another like five hours. So that's a, that's a big chunk out of my week right there. So this week is a really bad week for me in that vein of time, because last night we recorded the Gunna Geek show. We're down to once a month for that because every mm -hmm. single one of us like doing the show. Steven, Chris, and I like doing the show, but it doesn't fit in our schedules as much. So I said, okay, we're going to do it once a month. And I get to talk about the lead up to the moon on it, you know, the return to the moon on it and stuff. So really that's my drive to be on that show. It's my outlet for it. And uh, Steven likes doing it. And uh, our fans, our listeners like hearing us talk about it. So we're like, okay, we'll do it once a month. That was Monday. Tonight's Tuesday. We're doing this. Tomorrow's Wednesday. I'm doing better podcasting live chat. Steven takes care of all the editing for both the Guinea Geek show and the better podcasting main show. So I don't have to worry about that. I am helping out a friend that just had a stroke on the strange new worlds fan cast. It's actually therapy for her to do mm -hmm. the podcast. So it's a limited engagement. We're talking about Picard season three. I know you talked to Uma earlier yep, about yep. Picard season three on your show. And it's a limited engagement, 10 episodes. So I'm sucking it up for 10 weeks. There's seven left. Yeah. Uh, so under two months, I'm sucking it up specifically to help out. And then there's my show, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., which I do most of everything, but I don't do the show notes. That's another co-host. So I don't have that part of the prep. I still have to watch the material. I have to gather my own thoughts, but I don't have to do the full prep for it. So that helps out. Now, if yeah. it was just me, I, I first of all, I, I wouldn't be doing all the podcasts that I do. Secondly, I would do shorter shows. My shows are more like 45 minutes to an hour, 15 minutes. And I would be more like 20, 25 minutes on mm -hmm. the shows if I was doing that. So I was doing seven shows a week at one point in time. It was crazy. I've whittled that down to two and just in the span of, of seven weeks, I'm back up to five, a uh, couple of weeks, but uh, that is not sustainable long-term. Everybody agrees with that, realizes it. I've had talks with Steven, which is my podcast buddy. That's important to have a podcast buddy if you can. So I talked to him about it and he 
agreed that it was crazy and then offered to reduce the schedule of the show that I do with him, Better Podcasting, said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. I was mostly just complaining to you. And he, he realizes what I'm doing, what I'm doing. He also realizes that he didn't, he didn't, he doesn't think he would have made that, uh, that sacrifice that I did, but I did. So like I said, long-term friends, just helping out in this case, it's therapy plus taking over because they don't have time to do it because one of them. So it's a married couple. I'm friends with both of them. They're both podcasters and they simply both did not have the headroom for it. So I took over all the production, the editing and, uh, the hosting duties in place of the husband, Sean. So yeah, uh, good question. I prefer two shows a week or less, and I'm going to get to that point eventually again too, but it's going to be a couple of months. Yeah. Good luck with it. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thank you for joining me for this chat. And where is a place that everybody can find your great content, including that Andy Weir interview? (laughs) Oh, uh, SP, thanks for having me on the show. I've had a lot of fun and I've, I've learned a lot. I've been writing notes down while we've been talking. You can go to one place, get all the information. It's www.coffeeinspacepodcast.com. All one word. And it gets you everything. If you go under uh, listen now or listen here, you can uh, get several episodes there. Get your uh, appetite whetted a little bit. And then in the blog part of the page, put all the episodes there under their own headings so and then some of my commentaries in there too so coffee and space podcast.com you get all of it there plus ways to contact me and connect well that sounds great i'll definitely continue to be subscribing to your show thanks man i appreciate it i i've got yours on my uh calendar every week too cool all right well thank you very much thanks for having me And thank you for spending your time with Daniel and me over the past hour. If you like content like this, please subscribe to the Better Podcasting YouTube channel and like the video and ring that bell. Or if you are listening to the audio version, get Better Podcasting Chats with SP, a follow on your podcatcher app of choice. Well, Stephen and I would greatly appreciate it. Now, tomorrow night, Stephen and I will be recording episode 45. I promise this time. I do. I promise. Of the Better Podcasting live chat show. Uh, We were off last week because Stephen had some things he had to do. Now, for this show, Better Podcasting Chats with SP next week, I'm actually in the middle of working with another podcaster to try to join me next week. It might not work out. However, I do have somebody scheduled for two weeks from now, and I will definitely be back in two weeks if I am not back next week. In the meantime, you can always join our podcasting conversation on our Discord server, which is betterpodcasting.com slash Discord. You can find Stephen and myself there every day, and you can go ahead and ask your podcasting questions. Both us and others there are happy to answer it. We'll see everybody next time. Bye.